Bam! How many of you thought I was going to do that? <laughs> well, the reason I started out like that today, I did that at the UN on Saturday. But I was speaking to a bunch of cops uh, that work at the UN, security professionals. The reason I do that, I try to do that a lot of times. I can use this microphone or not. I, I speak pretty loud, but um, do I even need this microphone, you think? Probably not. One of the reasons why I like to start out speaking with BAM or something is that I like to shake people up a little bit, especially at 9.47 in the morning on a Tuesday, uh, just after uh, a weekend which we just went through 15 years ago after 9-11. Reflecting back on that, there's good things. There's some amazing, heroic things that happened that day. It's not always about the tragedy. It's about the heroic the events that happened, people charging into that fire, into that inferno, into chaos, and actually doing their job appropriately doing their job right. That's made up, that's a team that's made up of leaders. That's not just a gaggle that ran in there into those buildings hoping to save people. These are people that had standard operating procedures. They knew how to task organize. They knew how to communicate. They were fully aware of the things that were going on around them. Now this is a business association and it's very interesting, once I stepped out of the SEAL teams and into law enforcement and then from law enforcement out and got the entrepreneurial spirit and started to start my own company, I started to see the same type of success ratio from people like those men and women that charged into that building on 9-11, the people that assaulted the Osama bin Laden compound and took him out. What I started to see is that there's a very similar set of characteristics and behaviors amongst them and successful business people. Now a lot of you are probably thinking, what does it have to do with him turning around and saying, bam? Well, you have to be thinking outside of the box all the time. When I was at the UN and I did that same thing, there were a few people that jumped. But there were a majority of the people that were there, 300 of these officers, they just sat there stone-faced. It's not that they expected me to do that, but they expected anything, and they weren't surprised. So I always try to leave with a little bit of a teaching point, not just about leadership and teamwork. But since this falls right after 9-11, it's important for everybody here to understand something that I know that you probably don't know. I'm trained to kill. I'm trained to think like a bad guy. I'm also trained to think like a defender, having been in law enforcement. But I can tell you right now, there's no cop out there, there's no policymaker or administrator that can set up a technology or a barrier or any type of thing that they could come up with to keep me out as an attacker. I'll find a way in and I'll take out whoever or whatever I need to take out because I surround myself with teams of people that think like I do, that are trained like I am, that know my standard operating procedures. We know how to task organize. We're all leaders, but we know that there has to be a leader within the team, and we subscribe to that. And if any of us have to step up to the, the plate to be the leader, we do that. But you as individuals have to realize that when it comes to business or when it comes to safety, you have to think outside the box. You have to be understanding that the, the possibility, regardless of the probability, is always there for something to go wrong. But if you surround yourself with the right people, if you keep your mind open, if you know your critical areas, you know the times when those areas are critical, so the critical times, you know the vulnerabilities, that surround those areas, and you know the avenues of approach from which the bad guys will come, most likely you, not a technology, not a policy, not a gadget, 
you, your eyes, your awareness is the only thing that can defeat somebody like me. The only thing. Because I will find a way to get around whatever technology. I will find a way to exploit your laws in order to get around your policy. And I'll find a way to disable your technology. But your eyes and your awareness, that's what makes the human being such an incredible creature. And that's what makes people who get it in business so effective. And that's what I started to learn. That and the fact that when you own your own company and you don't know where your paycheck is coming from next in the next two weeks, it's the scariest thing I've ever had to deal with in my life. In the government, you get paid every two weeks. You know where your, your paycheck is coming from. Entrepreneurial spirit does not prepare you for that fear. That's a fear that makes you wake up in the middle of the night going, I got $2,000 worth of rent that's coming up every single month regardless of whether or not I'm making money. So, what you have to do is, same thing for a small business or a large business, for a leader in a company, or somebody who's a middle management in a company, or somebody who's at the very bottom of the company. What you have to do is you have to start looking at certain characteristics. Now, I have adult ADD, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I've been through all these careers where you have to be a hard charger in order to make it through the training alone in a lot of these different areas which I've been in. The other ones, like being in the FBI, probably the biggest part that's the, of that, that's the most difficult thing about going to work every day in the FBI uh, is are the accountants, because when you give an accountant a gun and a badge, they become the biggest know-it-all in the world. I know this room is filled with accountants. <laughs> They're the most dangerous human being on the earth, is an accountant with a badge and a gun. So dealing with them and trying to convince them sometimes, I know a little bit more than you do about this, was probably one of the most difficult things. But, but some of the best people I worked with were accountants and attorneys inside the bureau. Can't say about that, that about attorneys outside of the bureau. That's <laughs> but I have an ADD brain. That's why I have this piece of paper that's halfway ripped and I've used in many speeches, but I like to keep this here because not because I have to go back to it, but because this is my security blanket. This is how I can go back and refresh myself when even I get nervous or I mess up a little bit. But here are those, here are those critical things <clears throat> that I've seen in all the successful teams that I've been a part of and the successful businesses that I've dealt with since I've been out of the military and law enforcement. The first thing is that awareness is key. Just like when I started off, some of you were aware, somebody might have been, I hope I didn't make somebody spill their coffee. Somebody, some people may have just not cared, I don't care who this guy is, I just want to get out of here. But you have to be aware. Awareness at the bottom Individual awareness is what ultimately leads to team awareness. And it allows a team to be aware of 360 de degrees around them in any environment. You know how you play video games? I don't know if anybody in here has ever played a video game. Or if you look at a, a, a video on your camera, this is all you see. And after you go through uh, steel training, for instance, and we do room entries. So we'll come in as a team, similar to SWAT. We'll come into a room, and the stack comes in. The first guy will go this way. The second guy will go this way. The third guy comes over here. The fourth guy comes here. And then they flood the room, and then we go and take the whole room down. When you first start doing that, this is all you see. And you're breathing hard, and you come in, and you literally all you see is here. But after doing that for a couple of weeks, Imagine a couple of years. You literally see, when you walk in, you see everything. I mean, you can almost tell how many glasses are on that table. If somebody's in the corner over there, I see them. And you get the ability where you can draw on that person without having to actually focus. I mean, you're just, your, your awareness becomes that heightened individually. So if you take 20 of those guys, or 40, you can imagine how lethal they are because their awareness as a team it's, it, it's magnified by those numbers. So awareness is key to doing anything or running anything. First and foremost, you have to wake up and be aware of yourself. Who are you? What makes you happy? What makes you sad? What makes you angry? 
in New York and in New Jersey and traffic, you could probably go through all those emotions on the way to or from work. <laughs> but you need to think about those things. Where, where's your weakness? Be honest with yourself. What is your strength? I grew up in Arkansas. My mom said I cried for the first three years of my life, and then I started talking, and I never stopped. And so that's probably why I'm up here talking to you now. That's a gift I have. Some people are great writers. I'm a great talker. I, I, when I do a three-hour radio show, I don't even use an outline. I go in, I look at what my topics are, I focus on the key points of what I want to talk about and what I want to analyze, and then I go. And I have guests on there, and we, we just work it. But that's my gift. My downfall is that I am also a talker, and sometimes I talk too much, and people are like, please, will this guy ever shut up? <laughs> so my strength is also my weakness. But awareness is the key to taking the step into becoming a whole leader. And developing leadership is the key in the first step in developing a team. So what comes after awareness? Once you develop awareness, you then start to develop an understanding of the world around you. An understanding of what your job description is. As, a, as somebody who's in charge, you develop an understanding of what your position really is and what the position means to the people that are under you. But let's start at the bottom. As a new person coming into a company, awareness is key. Then you start to gain understanding. If you have a job description, which you should have, and if you have an aware boss who understands the different jobs, you will have a job description. Once you get the understanding of that job description, you'll know what it takes to be a success in that job or what is needed from you in the position that you're in. Once you gain the awareness and then you get the understanding, now you move into self-responsibility. And this is huge. This is probably just beyond the adolescent stage of becoming a leader where you start to stretch your arms a little bit and you start to feel your oats and burn your hands on the rope. Because once you see somebody get awareness of their potential, of their failures, they now have the ability to exploit their potential and overcome their failures or their weaknesses. Once you gain the understanding of the position in which you're in, you now understand how you can take the awareness that you have and work that position to the full extent possible. Then when you get to self-responsibility, what happens is you take responsibility for your failures, which means your failures are going to be temporary. You're going to be able to overcome those failures because you have the awareness, because you understand your job, you take the responsibility for it, and trust me, SEALs definitely take responsibility for when they do things right, as most people do. They love for you to know when they did something right. As we can see in the news, this, this turned out to be a, kind of a problem in the news lately. But that's okay. That, that's probably their, their downfall, is that they like to exploit what they did right. But every SEAL I know, when they do something wrong, they're the first to admit it. And they're first to say, this is how I can do it better because they take responsibility for their actions. So once they gain the awareness, they have the understanding of the position that they have, they start to gain the self-responsibility. Now what happens is they start to trust their actions. Once they trust their actions, they know that they're aware of everything that's going on around them. They're aware of their potential, of their successes, they're aware of where their weaknesses are and their strengths. They understand which way they're supposed to go. They understand how they, what the job description actually says, and they take full responsibility for their actions. They start to trust that if they have to draw their weapon, or if they have to draw out a mission plan, or if they have to brief a general or admiral, that they're going to be able to do it. They have faith in themselves. And what happens when an individual gets to this level, well, as owners of business, businesses or high-level managers, what you start to see is you start to identify the go-to person. You start to identify, 
that is the person, the man or woman that I can trust when things need to get done. So trust in oneself breeds trust from others. Because when you trust your own actions and you're not lying to yourself and saying, I got this, when you don't got it, when you, when you trust yourself based on awareness, based on understanding, based on responsibility of self, when you trust yourself, others are going to see that and they're going to trust you too. That's when you get command and presence as well. That's the beginning of command and presence. And for those of you that don't know what that is, when I walk into this room, even if you didn't know that I was the, the keynote speaker here today, you would still know there's something about this guy. Not just a shaved head, not just a goatee. But when you talk to me, those of you that talk to me, I talk with confidence. I know and I'm aware of who I am. I understand my abilities. I take full responsibility for the things I'm good at and the things I'm not. And I trust my actions. So when I talk to somebody, I'm confident. And people know when they talk to me, this, there's something about this guy. I think I can ask him to do whatever I need done. It's going to get done. So the trust goes both ways. Once the trust is established, now what you start to see is motivation starts to pour in, not creep in, starts to pour in. So along with the awareness and the understanding of position, with the responsibility for your actions, the trust of yourself, the trust of others, you become more motivated and others become more motivated to be there with you. What happens when that occurs? Now, you have a group of people who take initiative. Those of you that have been managers in this world or business owners, initiative is like that thing that we used to call it when I was growing up in the South, a Skype, where somebody would say, I know it's a, a thing that you do on the phone now, but a Skype used to be something that, hey, go, we take this trash bag and we're gonna go Skype them. And we would go out in the middle of nowhere and there's no such thing, and we'd be walking around in the middle of nowhere forever, and everybody else would be back to camp laughing. That is as rare of an animal as people who take initiative. And that's because people don't understand that you have to have awareness, that you have to understand your job position. You have to take responsibility for your actions, and you have to trust yourself. They don't understand that to get trust, you have to be aware, have understanding, and take responsibility. And if you don't have trust in yourself, others aren't going to trust you. And most people aren't motivated to be there. They're not in the moment. They think, I want money, or I want power, or I want to be that. I want that haircut. I want to be this guy. I want to be that girl. They don't realize that being your best, no matter what you are, is, is what success is all about. And that's motivated. And once you get all this stuff and you start to get, you see this rare creature called initiative come out, what happens is people go beyond their job description and they do the things that you don't have to ask them to do. They do the things that they see need to be done, not just to get the, the minimal standard, but to get the best. To get the best. And that's what makes a leader. That right there is how you build a leader. Despite what people say, and I've seen men crumble when they have to stare into their soul and question themselves, do I want to be here? Men show up to be seals. They put their whole life, young life, into being there. And they get there, it's colder than you can ever imagine. It's it's more miserable than any single day of your life that you can imagine. And it goes on and on and on for 10 months in my case. Some people get injured and they're there longer. Now that doesn't sound like a lifetime when people say 10 months, but trust me, when you are cold and wet and dirty and hungry and worried that somebody's going to ruin your dream, it is a stress that can only be magnified by war and by being in battle. 
But defeating that, defeating that are the people who step in, that learn along the way, that leaders are not born. I've seen plenty of leaders crumble. Leaders are made. Some are self-made, some are taught by mentors. But there's no doubt in my mind that leaders are not born. Some people are better at parts of this equation. But it really <coughs> takes experience. It takes understanding. It takes time to really cultivate a great leader. Now, once you have the awareness of yourself, once you get the understanding of your job description, the environment around you, once you start to take responsibility for your actions and you start to trust those actions, others start to trust you. You become motivated. Once you become motivated, you'll start taking initiative and going outside of your job description. That's when you become a leader. Now, when you have leaders in a group, you have a team. But a team without leaders is really just a gaggle. And I know you all have seen that. Groups of people that walk around and they do a task that they're asked to do, it never measures up to the potential that it could be, or it's never sustained. That's a gaggle. Or Washington, D.C., whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but Washington, D.C. is a good example of that. The government gets a paycheck every April for a trillion dollars. They don't have to go outside of their job description. In fact, most of them don't even approach the potential or the minimal job description that we give them. I don't care what your political affiliation is. They're all failures. And they're failures because we, the managers, don't hold them to that standard. But I think it's not because we're lazy or because, as we were talking about earlier, stupid is, uh, as Boris Gump said, stupid is as stupid does. Um, the American people have become more stupid. Stupid is something, again, that is a choice. It's not something that, uh, that you're born with. If you're born with the ability to educate yourself and, and research and actually take the time to get to know things, you will not be stupid. It's a hard word to say. People don't like that word, but, but it's the truth. It does exist greatly. But that's a good example in D.C. of a gang or a group of people who come together and function as a group but rarely get things done. And when they do get it done, it's not done appropriately, and it's not done to the best uh, that it could be done. Most of the policies that come out of Washington, D.C. are compromised, full compromise. Not full, effective answers. And that's the difference between you all, is that you have the opportunity in your businesses and your life to be effective. Once you surround yourself and you understand, you have to have awareness. Again, I go over these things so you can walk out of your understanding. You have to get the awareness of yourself. Once you have the awareness, you can have the understanding of the environment around you of your job description. Once you have the understanding, you get to you start taking self-responsibility. You then start to trust your actions. Others start to trust you. You're motivated to do the job, and you take the initiative. You become a leader. When you work with other leaders, what happens? You get teamwork done. And teamwork is way different than the results that a gaggle will give you or a group. So what's the next step in this? Well, when I talked to the guys, the men and women at the UN, I talked about awareness of the team. You see, teamwork allows all the individuals who are aware, that have the understanding and the responsibility and the trust and the motivation to take the initiative. It allows every single person to push all those good things into a group. And then it makes like a super laser that can just destroy or fix anything. But in business, in business, you may not be a part of an assault group that's going somewhere to take something down or coming up with a mission plan. There may be a lot of day-to-day -day opera. Your, your entire company may be a set of repetitive uh, steps that you take on a daily basis in order to create that widget or to make this particular thing or carry out this, this, uh, this process. 
it is important for you as a leader to understand that it's okay to have other leaders that know more than you do in certain areas. In fact, I found from being a leader, it's great to have people around me that know more than I do because it makes my job really easy. A manager of leaders, for a leader among leaders, is really the easiest job. In ranger school, when I went to ranger school, which is completely different than SEAL training, we only ate once a day and slept two hours a day for 62 days. <laughs> Yeah, it was miserable. Was that? It's not. It's not something I say. Ranger school. Remember them good old times? That's not. <laughs> I don't say that about Ranger school. And I did that after SEAL training. So the majority of the time, every, while everybody else is flipping out because they're hungry or whatever, I know I can make it through. And I'm just sitting there like, I just want to get through this. I'm just hungry. I want to go to sleep. There's no greater pain in the world. I know you guys know this. Than trying to stay awake when somebody's talking is boring. Or when they say, I just need you to stare in this direction, and you're like, about three hours later, and you get no sleep. And so, one thing I learned in ranger school is that the people that want to be there, that have this, this series of, of characteristics about them that they've learned, those are the people that you can count on when they're in a leadership position, not to yell at people, not to force people to do stuff, but to motivate the other people who are motivated and to say, okay, this is what I need. Susie, I need to do this. Larry, I need to do that. Tom, I need to do that. Angela, I need to do that. And boom, he sends the leaders out and they go do whatever task they have and they come back with it completed to the best of it, it could be, to the best of their ability. And then that manager takes what they gave him and then turns that either into the mission profile, like if we're planning a mission, um, and it offers that up to the higher command. But if you have what we call solar power rangers who don't want to be there and had to go there because their command forced them to be there, at 3 o'clock in the morning, first and foremost, they're the most useless people in the world. And when they get put into a leadership position, all they do is lead by yelling. And they scream at people and they say, you need to go do this. And they, they bark orders. They, the only command presence they have is that people fear them because they know that it's not going to work out and you're probably going to get in trouble. What I found going through ranger school because it's such a stressful environment and everybody's so miserable is that when people are miserable, that's a bad thing. But when you make them more miserable, it's a, a recipe for disaster and a recipe for failure. But if you're motivated and you show them that you can be trusted as a leader, and you surround yourself with these people that you can trust because they take responsibility for themselves, because they understand their job, because you, the leader, has shown them what their job is. And then you make sure, if they're not self-aware, you sit down and have a conversation with them to guide them. Now you've become a leader amongst leaders. And what happens when you do that, the teamwork that you process is going to be amazing. And that's really the difference between like, law enforcement and SEAL teams is that you all are not dealing with people that are mechanized, people that have gone, or institutionalized, I call it mechanized, but institutionalized, where they know they're being told to do this, they're going to do this. You know, you're, not, you're not dealing with civilians. Civilians are totally different. I found that out. I'm a civilian now. People tell me, I want you to do this, I'll say, okay, I'll do it. But I'm motivated, so I get it done. So as leaders, you have to realize that you may be aware, you may understand your job description, you may be fully responsible for your actions and trust your own actions. Let's just leave out the trust of others for a second. You may be fully motivated to be in your job, at your position, you get a good salary for your successful business, and you take a lot of initiative. If you as leaders don't take the time to identify based on skill, based on work ethic, based on awareness, understanding, responsibility, trust, motivation, initiative, the people who are leaders that work for you, you are already failing yourself. But if you find that you don't have a lot of people who have those skills, it's up to you as a leader to cultivate those skills. 
Because remember what I told you. Leaders are not born. Leaders are made. And if you have somebody that knows what they're doing, and you, t you set out to teach these specific skills, you will see a leader blossom in front of you. And when you have leaders working for you, anything you do, I don't care if it's in the military, I've seen this before. We got an admiral coming, and you see a, a, a commander in there helping us wash toilets to get the bathroom clean. But those bathrooms are the clean, you can eat off those toilets. Because, first off, we don't put ourselves, as, and I was an officer in the SEAL team, we don't put ourselves above our men. We're, we're, we are all warriors. And I'm a manager or a leader of leaders. And you have to be that way in your company. Even if you're the richest, if you're the most experienced, you should still be humble and motivate those who are motivated and help those that are not motivated to become motivated by, again, helping them become aware, helping them understand their job description. If they don't have a job description, give it to them. Tell them, this A, B, and C is a success. If you don't do A, B, and C, you're not a success. Sometimes it's really that easy to give a job description, but give it. Help them understand the importance of being responsible and saying, I failed at this. And as a leader, don't crush people because they fail. It doesn't mean they're a failure. It means they messed up this, or they didn't have the information needed to get it done, or maybe they're lazy. And in any case, you either get rid of the, the lazy person, you give them, you show them what the job is one more time, and then get rid of them if they don't do it, or if they need more instruction, you give it to them. And this whole thing is cyclical. Once you become aware of yourself, you'll have the understanding, the responsibility, the trust, others will trust you, you'll be motivated, you take the initiative, you have a team, you're a leader, you, you have a team full of leaders, you do teamwork, and the next thing you know, everybody's aware and you all are driving forward in everything that you do. This works in anything that you do. It works in church groups. It works in business. It works in military. It works in city council planning. Anything. If you focus on these, cultivating these characteristics and these behaviors, you will see that the business and the work that you do will start to transform into a success. And remember, I'm gonna, I'll leave you with this. I think that's probably why. I could go on forever. <laughs> Success and failure. They, they're two different things. But being a failure is totally different than failing. And being a success doesn't mean that you're the best all the time. It may not even mean that you are the best. Being a success is somebody that has failed and learned and continues to succeed, continues to try. I know people who have no money, and I grew up extremely poor in, in Arkansas. When I mean extremely poor, we, I'm probably, well, I don't know, I'm sure there still are families out there. We had pump water in an outhouse when I grew up. It was me and my three sisters in one room, my parents in the other room, and we had to heat water in a pot on a stove, a wood-burning <coughs> stove, in order to take a bath. That's how poor I was when I grew up. I know people who grew up like that who are the biggest successes in life. They don't have, they've never been to a place like this. They don't have anything. But they're a success because they never let their failures tamper down who they are. I can talk to those people, they're self-aware. They always understood the predicament that they were in or how they could, and they always are giving things away, these types of people, because they understand the world that they live in. They take full responsibility for all their actions. And they trust themselves, they trust the people around them, the people around them trust them. They're always motivated no matter what they have or don't have, and they always take the initiative to help others. So being a success does not mean that you always have to be succeeding. In fact, being a success means that you're going to have a lot of failures, and as a leader, you have to recognize that in the people that work for you. When they fail, you don't have to crush them. You have to analyze why they failed. But you want somebody who's constantly stepping up to the plate that you have to slow them down and 
describe their job and help them better themselves so they can further succeed. And I speak honestly, this is the last thing I close with this, I speak from the heart when I tell you this. I've learned more about success from watching failed leaders than I have from anything I've ever done in my life. I've had all these big, big successes. I've, I have challenged myself in ways that most people will never be able to, to challenge themselves. I've looked at my soul and said, I don't like this, I'm going to change it. And that's a scary thing when you open your soul up and you look inside it. And you say, I don't want to be here, but I'm not going to quit. But all the motivation that I have has been crushed several times just simply because I had a leader that did not understand how to lead. The person was not motivated. The person didn't want to trust anybody. They really didn't care about why you failed or succeeded. They didn't reward you when you succeeded. They didn't sit you down and discuss why you failed. They never gave me a job description which would automatically set me up for failure and could care less who I was, potential, or if I was aware of any of that. So I've learned about leadership and success by, be, by having my motivation stolen from me from, by bad leaders. So if you're a leader in here, and I think everybody is safe to say in here is a leader in one way or another, it's important for you all to realize that just like you can build a leader, you can crush a leader. And when you do that, you are, in essence, stabbing yourself in your own back and destroying the potential that you and your companies can have. So remember that. I come from the teams. That's what the SEAL teams are called, the teams. And I've seen people crushed because of bad leaders. So thank you all very much. I appreciate all your time. One thing that makes me proud to come and speak to groups like this is the fact that you don't let race, gender, sexuality, where you're from, uh, you don't, whether you're liberal or conservative, you all don't let those things stand in your way to be a success. Everybody sitting here are people who contribute to this country. And I have served, and the people who live and die serve to give you the freedom to be your best. Not the freedom to be the best uh, woman or man or whatever race you may be or whatever sexuality. We serve so that you can have the opportunity to be your best. And when somebody gets in your way and says, I'm judging you because of this, this is all you have to do. Step around that person and keep achieving. And that's what I see in this group are people that are achievers. And I thank you with a heartfelt thanks for not just standing idle and doing nothing with your life. You've done something. You've been a success. You're here. You're motivated. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. You're listening to me talk. You are people that are making a difference in your lives, regardless of what other people say, regardless of what other people do. You are a success, and I thank you. You probably wondered why well, I have a Navy SEAL talk at a business event. But remember, and we'll remember, we'll, we'll uh, <clears throat> have that reinforced in just a few minutes after a quick break. The theme of these awards was teamwork and collaboration. And so, what could be a more perfect lead into the awards than, than that presentation? And Jonathan, thank you once again for joining us and sharing your insights and, and, and for your service to our country. Thank, thank you. you. With that, I encourage you to take a quick 10 minute break to stretch and then we'll get into the award portion. So, good time for stretch.